You could have given up, but you didn't. You could have stopped believing, but you didn't. You could have kept living their expectations, but you decided to make this life your own. And in turn, you're here. Hello everyone, today we're meeting Alison Smith. She is an author, a poet, a speaker and a podcaster. Hello, Alison. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, Ara. Thanks for having me. Yes. So let's start our conversation by diving into your personal journey of becoming the person you are today. Uh, so just uh, share with us your experiences that led you to this point and what was the turning point for you? How did you realize your true passion in life? Um. I think there's a number of turning points. I think before work, um, I just was living it. So there's, there's, I've sort of gone back to what I was doing when I was younger now. So before life got hold of me. <laughs> so if I look at what I was doing um, as a teenager, I was a chairman of the area youth council. I was speaking on behalf of, um, you know, things that were not right I suppose um, taking action working with other young people and then did the same when I got to university and was a chairman again so always used to standing up in front of people and talking and then I got to work <laughs> and um, and then I got married and and I think all that went out the window and I just got on the I don't know whether it was the hamster wheel, but I think it was definitely buying into all of the shoulds, usts, shoulds musts and oughts of this is what life should be like. Um, and then I suppose that the, the kicks, the first kickstart was um, the marriage ending. And I suddenly realised I didn't think about life, <laughs> which bearing in mind what I now do is just... Wow, you know bizarre because I absolutely could be argued think too much about life and you know what's going on in our minds and why we do what we do but I didn't think of any of that before the marriage um, ended um, and so I was sort of hurled back into life really once the marriage finished and uh, did a neuro-linguistic programming um practitioner master practitioner trainer training and was suddenly bombarded with all these beautiful ways in which you know mind body soul um, kept going on other different workshops that sort of added to that toolkit um so that was the first catalyst I suppose that shoved me into that oh that's well, well we need to think about our mind and we have a choice so I think I was very much at the receiving end of life thinking definitely in in the life is doing this to me so um yeah I wouldn't be taking as much personal responsibility very proactive not uh, very reactive rather um so that's the first catalyst then uh, you know I'm in another job and uh started using um metaphors to explain because I'm procurement professional sort of in and amongst started to explain to internal stakeholders about supplier management now you know I don't know how interested you'd be about supplier management most people listening just yeah I'll listen whatever um and and so were the managers in the organization but the problem there was we wanted them to pay attention to supplier management so I started using a gardening metaphor to say, but you know about gardens and you know that gardens need mowing and pruning and you need to think about the soil and perhaps some plants need time in the greenhouse. And and every, all the managers went, uh-huh. And we went, well, suppliers are the same. And suddenly they went, oh, oh God, yeah, we've just been plonking our suppliers in a corner. We've been thinking they'll grow even if we ignore them. Um, we don't think about the soil conditions. So suddenly they could apply everything they knew about gardening, even if they didn't know a lot, to supplier management. And so that was when I, oops, oh, metaphor works. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then I think my own journey of learning about me and receiving feedback from others and how I resolve problems in my own life, I'll run rings around myself and argue why that's a bad idea. And so metaphor came out of neuro-linguistic programming. And um, so I sort of realized, oh, oh, I could do meta, you know, use metaphor a bit more. Um, and so the gardening as a metaphor for supplier management suddenly became um, nature's landscapes as metaphors for life. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went back to work and was just sort of, I suppose, doing it at the edges. So allowed to use the coaching and all the tools I've got, but still doing procurement. And then a new boss came along and said, we don't want you really. (laughs) Um, And so I was forced to make a decision, really. I could either stay and not be doing all of my coaching. because That's what he said. He said, I want somebody to do procurement. I don't want a mother hen. Because I had been the person people would go to you know, when people had problems, I I ended up being the the team coach, I suppose. So I'd be the one that would solve problems, whether it's work problems or life problems, or help people solve problems. Um, So then that sort of pushed me out, um, out of sort of working for uh, full time for organisations, and therefore, then sort of started doing a little bit of consultancy, coaching and training. So I suppose, yeah, the divorce kick-started me into all of the mind and the ability to change that and then the change of boss forced me out into the world a bit um covid mm, trying to work out whether that's i don't know that that's been such a good thing because i was out in the world a lot more before covid and i'm i'm a bit reticent to get back out there again i think Oh, yeah, you have such a good journey and a lot of things happen along the way. And you realize something for yourself that nature could be our coach and the landscaping actually, uh, you know, it's kind of a metaphor of uh, how we live our life. So we can see ourselves in nature because we're part of it, right? Mm -hmm. And I want you to elaborate more of how would you use landscape in your coaching practice? Um, The interesting thing is quite often, um, there's a few ways of doing it. One would be somebody comes with a problem and I go, let's go for a walk outside or they can be outside in nature. So I've had calls where I'm in the office in Scotland and somebody's in America wandering around, you know, nature in America. So I don't have to be there with them. But if ideally, if they're here with me, we go for a walk and I might say, and I'm looking out the window as I say it, but so what part of the landscape in front of you represents either where you are, where you want to be, what are you drawn to? And we might just use the landscape as a metaphor in that way where it's, oh, I feel like I had somebody once where, oh, I just feel like that estuary in front of me and the estuary was um the sea was out or the tide was out so the estuary was really muddy and there was just a little slither of of, of, um water up the middle because the, the tide was out and there was no water there and we went for a walk and we walked along the headland and we did various bits Mm-hmm. Um, of practice and sort of shifted the mindset and then of course when they came back the tide had come in and so suddenly this muddy estuary was full of water and, and there was wildlife there and so they felt as if th- th- this estuary was now reflecting back to them the change that they'd done so nature can sometimes just do that but the book can't see the wood for the trees And a lot of the second series of the podcast is is picking up on people's language because what I realised was having used it for 10 years, 15 years before I really honed in on the language piece, when we're stuck, we quite often exclaim, oh, I'm stuck in a rut or I want to turn a corner or I can't see in the UK, I can't see the wood for the trees. Um, And... 
what I realized was that you're really the person is handing themselves a solution on a plate, but they're doing it in a way that is a bit hidden. And as much that they're saying, I'm stuck in a rut, can't see the wood for the trees. And they believe that that is, I'm stuck. There is anything I can do, that's it, I'm stuck. Whereas what I do is say, whoa, you've got a beautiful metaphor there that lets mine for solutions. So you can't see the wood for the trees, you think there are no solutions. Okay, let's put that to one side. We're not going to come back and look at the problem. I don't want to know about the problem for a bit now. We're sending it on a coffee break, as I say. <laughs> and then what would you do in a real wood? Oh, and then suddenly from saying there are oh, no, you know, I'm, I can't see the wood for the trees. Oh, well, I'd follow a path out or I'd cut the trees down or I'd get to higher ground. And suddenly, and, and that particular metaphor has hundreds of answers, um, is that you end up with a lovely list of solutions. And then it, then you can say, so which of those solutions is most applicable to you? So I can remember uh, being in a wood with sort of um, a small group of business people. They were there in their suits. I don't think I'd warned them we were going for a walk. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we were embodying can't see the wood for the trees. And uh, I don't, a, a warden went through and we obviously looked lost and uh, said, oh, do you need a map? And so it was just that whole, yes, how, which, you know, are any of you in need of a map? What is it about a map? You don't have a map for the life. Um, I mean, sometimes with Can't See the Wood for the Trees, I, I always remember this one, one um, call where I said to the person, so where in this landscape do you need to be? And they went, oh, the other side of the wood. And I went, mm. So why do you need to see the wood? Oh, I don't. Oh, I don't. <laughs> uh, oh, and, and it was a huge realisation that, that wood represented every other thing they were using to distract themselves from going, with taking their business where they wanted their business to go. They knew where they wanted the business to go. But what was happening was every time they got a, an, a, to a different path in the wood, it was as if they're going, oh, perhaps I don't want to go there. Let me go and explore this path first. Mm -hmm. And then they'd get lost in that path. And then they'd come back to the main path. And then they go, oh. So it was a bit, um, here we'd sort of go on about magpies liking shiny things. So it was a bit like they were getting distracted by all the shiny new things. Even though when I said to them, where do you want to be? Oh, the other side of the wood. I don't want to be. It's, it's not about this wood. Mm. And what that enabled them to do, because the metaphor is so clean, it's not it's, it's not clean in as much that we're assuming that the normal rules of nature apply. Um, so, it, and sometimes people's metaphors in their mind might not apply in that way. But nevertheless, we're not we're not stuck in the somebody talking about their business and well my you know I said I was going to do this and well you know my turnovers that or oh well the clients won't want that that's put to one side and you can go I just need to get to the other side of the wood okay so what does that represent what does that destination the other side of the wood look like in this situation and then they'll go oh well it's that okay so what's the plan to do that not the plan that you've got currently, which is explore every other opportunity and option that you're scared you might <laughs> be wrong about. So it's, and it's, if you listen to people's language when they're stuck, that they're saying it, that they're using metaphor. And therefore for me, then stop, use the metaphor because it's so much easier to find solutions if you do it that way around. Wow, yeah, so that's interesting way of kind of like showing people the nature path to some kind of destination, which is physical, and they trying to get to that place, but on the way they get distracted by some other, uh, I don't know, like shiny things like you described or some water or pound, whatever that might be. But at the same time, they don't realize what's going on in their mind and why they've been distracted. But 
with you kind of reflecting back to them what they say and how they, you know, act at the moment, they see it for themselves and that gives them clarity to understand what really takes for me to get where I'm going. And actually it also helps to, to resolve some kind of issue they might have in their business, personal, professional life. And that's a great way to look at it. And, uh, you know, that's a new perspective, I would say, on things. And I also want you to, um, to elaborate more on the other aspect of nature. So if we are part of it, you know, we're just different form of, uh, you know, kind of like being here, right? And um, all of the nature has its own innate ability to be the best that it can be. So as we, as human beings as well, and we have that blueprint in us and we were born with it, but something, you know, gets along the way where we kind of, prevent ourselves to be that version that we can be. So what do you think stops people from being their best version of themselves? What usually uh, you encountered in your coaching practice as one of the main reasons people don't let themselves to go to the right direction? Great question. Um... The immediate answer is the must sorts and shoulds. It's the belief that there's a one way and that people are going to uh, desert them, uh, label them. So I think my journey has always been I'm quite a, a laugh. You know, I laugh. I'm quite outlandish, I suppose, at times. And that's my journey. My journey has been that people don't want me to be the quiet Alison. They want me to be the loud Alison they'll forgive me being loud because that's me because when I'm loud I'm not suppressing any of me so I think that there's a we 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 think we're not going to be accepted by others so you're right when I look when I ask people in that situation to look at nature I go are you judging any part of that nature and it's like well no because the sea's the sea the tree's the tree um you know a weed isn't a weed, we're just judging it as a weed anyway. Um, and so I think there's that element of it, really, the fact that we we think we're not going to be loved, ultimately. And, and I can remember on one workshop, um, somebody pulling a kindness card and saying, I didn't know I could bring that into business. And I was just a bit shocked. So I think this, <laughs> I think we we take with us a whole load of beliefs about what we think we ought to do in business particularly. Uh, so I talk a lot about taking our humanity into business, but it, but it is about the world needs us, you know, the world needs me to be my tree and they need you to be your lake and somebody else's, you know, cloud because nature can only do what nature does with, if all of those bits work. You know, um, my company is a corporate partner for a rewilding organization. And, you know, they talk about bringing back in some predators that a lot of people would go, oh, we don't want them. But actually, them being there in the environment enlivens the whole of the um, landscape, that suddenly the landscape operates better rather than it, everybody being very. Um, I suppose it's the trees sit there and the river goes there and we're going to make the river go in this particular direction. And we don't want wolves here and we don't want this cat or whatever. Um, and it actually, when we when we bring all of nature's elements in, into being, into balance, that's when nature works at its best. And I think on the on the whole, that's how we work, that if we're if we're all of who we are, then people relate to us better. I can always remember there's, <laughs> there's, there's a speaker who I really admire on a one-to-one -one basis. And then they stand up in front of a group of people and they 
are not the person I speak to on a one to do basis because they make a judgment that the audience can't cope with all of who they are. But it's as if people are sitting there going, that person's not telling me the truth and they don't know what they're not telling them the truth about. So the truth that, he, that they are saying doesn't land in the same way because the person's going, there's, a, there's, there's something not right here. And they, and they don't know what's not right. It's just that he's not telling all of the story. Whereas I work on the premise that tell all of the story. If people don't understand it, don't get it, they'll just get the bit they do understand. But at least they know it's all of me. Now, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> no, it was perfect. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I agree. So if we were you know, being ourselves, being authentic selves, true to who we are, not trying to copy anybody or, you know, basically we usually compare ourselves with other people and we are very competitive in nature, but at our own expense, you know, because people feel your energy. If you're trying to be somebody else, it's not going to work the same way. You're not going to deliver that message in the same uh, powerful way that you could if only you were honest with who you are and just sharing that from the heart without pretending to be somebody else. And that's where the power is. But like you said, a lot of people are um, not ready to, you know, open up because deep down it comes back to your feeling of self-worthiness and loving yourself. If you were, if you know that you are here for a reason, right, and you have a purpose and like you just described the landscape and uh, metaphor in terms of us being you know, that part, that I would say like tree, right? We are a certain type of tree to be here in, in the landscape. And that's the tree that we were supposed to be. And we cannot be the other tree because this is not who we are, <laughs> right? And we yeah. have a certain role to play being that type of person here and kind of sharing our own unique gifts and skills and abilities with others in terms of serving others. And that's how together we can create that environment where everybody thrives, right? But if we are trying to be somebody who we are not supposed to be, it's not going to work the same way. And ultimately, we're not going to feel fulfilled in the end. Don't you think Definitely. so? Yeah, definitely. I wrote a poem and I can't remember. I, I keep meaning to put the, the words of the poems right next to my desk when I do podcasts. But there's one about reclaiming all our parts. And it's about, you know, the forgotten parts, the discarded parts, the unloved parts. It's I love all of my parts. I give breath to all of my parts. I love all my all of my parts and all of my parts love me is the ending of it. Um, and. I, I, in the video blog I do of the poem, I um, I think you know I'm just going to write read it out loud, and, um, and 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 I was sitting down and I got a bad knee. I, I had recently had a knee replacement, and um, so I'm thinking I'm just going to be able to sit down and read the poem for the blog. Oh no! I had to shout it out loud in the wood. You know, it's like I reclaim all my parts. You know, and um, but there was something quite powerful about. Ignore, sort of stating that out loud um but even though there was nobody else there the nature was there to hear me claim that that's what I was going to do yes we have to be um uh, feeling safe and secure to open up and just to speak up either just you know to ourselves or in front of the others and not being in a place where we feel judged or thinking about other people's opinions of us because it doesn't matter what they think. That's their life. And, you know, what they choose to think it's their business. It's not my business, right? So I'm responsible for my own uh, thoughts, emotions, and actions. And also taking care of myself, 
making sure I create the right environment for me to flourish into fully being who I am. And that's what we should be focusing on rather than wasting that energy. And again, in the end, feeling stuck and not allowing ourselves to flourish. So uh, what do you think would be the best practices for people to, uh, to become more mindful of what matters in their lives and maybe some type of uh, daily habits that they could develop oh, uh, that would help them to look in the right direction? Um, daily habits for me would be going out into nature, I think. Um, not least because there's lots of you know mental health and um, physical health benefits of that. Um, I think the other, the other thing is just to notice the language. I, I mean, gratitude, you know, doing the uh, gratitude logs is really helpful. And in fact, I suppose if that's somebody starting new, then that's perhaps where I'd suggest we start, which is the because quite often we're coming in very negative about ourselves, about the situation, about why am I, you know, why am I still stuck? And therefore the gratitude log of just at the end of the, every day, writing three things down that say, what am I grateful for? Can just um, shift the mindset into observing, I suppose, potentially from half full to uh, well, half empty to half full. Um, and therefore with that, revised mindset it's much easier then to start to look for other um unnoticed other opportunities that would help right we uh should you know incorporate gratitude in our daily practice because sometimes we're just thinking we're always missing something we're trying to chase something but we don't realize how much is available for us right now we have all those tools around us well we're not using them right if only we were uh we could focus on what we have in our life and be grateful for it it's always something you can be grateful for even start with one thing but then two three but really focusing on what you have and more will come to your life right so yeah. again it's just a shift of mindset and perspective that matters but doing that on a daily basis and really like um knowing that you are being supported that you are uh you know if you just willing to do what you like and feeling that type of joy and you know enjoying the process because it could be different for any one of us but with us really dedicating time to doing what we love is important because then we will see how that could evolve into something bigger and perhaps be something that we do as a business you know and I always um uh, ask people like what do you think um you know people could start with to in order to develop that type of you know joy what kind of um I would say like either either mindset shift or like exercises they can do that could bring them okay. to the place that they could see their own passion or potential so they can develop it further but Two, there's two, and I'll do the first one because that's quick, and then I'll do the, the the one that I really would encourage people to do. The, the first one is just, and this is something I start every training session with, which is start the day saying, what mindset do I need to be in to get the most out of today? Mm -hmm. And from a neuroscience point of view, articulating, either saying it out loud or writing it down. So it's not just thinking it, it's saying, I want to be more focused today. I want to be more optimistic today. Whatever the mindset is, your brain will hear that and is more likely to give it you. So be a bit more mindful about the mindset you need to be in to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. However, the other thing that I absolutely get so much out when I do it, and I do do quite sort of on a fairly, at least once a year, do a 28 day, day do something different every day challenge. Mm. And oh, I can't tell you how, if, now, 
you could do it for a weekend. But the, but what I have personally found is if you do it for a weekend, you pick the easy things. Oh, I'll do my uh, brush my teeth with a different hand. Oh, I'll put my socks on before something else when I'm getting dressed. Or I'll you know use my left hand instead of my right hand. So you need to get past the sort of the obvious things. And I think that that takes a few days to do. Because once you get beyond that, you suddenly, well, I anyway, and others who have done it, discover the things that they quite often say no to. Mm -hmm. So at the age of, I don't know, 55, I'd always said no to coffee. I don't like the taste. You know, in my head, oh, I don't like the taste. But a whole story about why I said no to coffee. And I and I, when I was doing this, do something ever different every day, I said, well, all right, well, I'll say yes to coffee then. So that's when I do something different. So in a cafe, I said yes to coffee. Now, I'm not saying that it was beautiful and that I'll absolutely have coffee every day. But But it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And what it then did do, because because actually I was saying no to coffee and hot drinks, was when I was at the next meeting and somebody said, shall we go for a coffee? Instead of me saying, oh, no, I'll stay here. I went, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll have a coffee. And so we went to the coffee shop to get a coffee. So it opened up that opportunities that I'd completely missed of having chats with people, of just going to the coffee shop, because I'd got into the habit of saying no. Um, and so I think we just uncover by doing something different every day over, a, you know, for 28 days and then doing it again six months, eight months later, we just start to peel away some of those onion layers, I suppose, of ways in which we're either protecting our lives um, putting barriers between us and others, um, making it smaller. But it's done in a quite a, a gentle way. So, I mean, if I was out with a friend and she said, you always say no to, to, to olives. You've got to, today's do something different is, is say yes to an olive. And we've got a brilliant picture of me going, you know, <laughs> scrunching my face up. It's like, no, I still don't like olives. You know, that's that's not something that my palate likes, thanks. So we'll, we'll find things where we quickly go back to what we were doing previously. But for me, doing something different every day is a really gentle way of us noticing some patterns or habits where we're on autopilot. I think that's the thing. It's in the same way as even the metaphors. They just bring into conscious awareness patterns of behavior, patterns of thinking that are prohibiting us from achieving whatever it is we say we want. And, and but it's done gently because we can laugh. We can laugh about the fact that I've said yes to coffee, having said no and going, oh, it's not that bad, is it? You know, mm -hmm. oh, really? Yeah, definitely. And I like uh, this exercise. And I think a lot of people would benefit from it. If we just give ourselves, like you said, 20 days, so one month of just taking on that challenge for yourself, and pick one thing every day that you never done before, or try to switch the way you look at things that you used to do in the past. So it can open up opportunities that yes. you would, you know, prevent yourself from going to uh, if only you continue doing the same pattern of, uh, you know, activities that you used to do in the past. But now, like with that curious mindset, we are exploring what else is there in life that could bring us that type of joy and fulfillment and how we can better connect with others as well because here we live like in a society and we have to be you know uh kind of always mindful of how we think and also be compassionate with others and knowing that uh networking is important and also like uh if we can just uh find a way to collaborate in a beneficial, mutually beneficial way, then we can create something, you know, that 
never been done before. And, you know, always there are opportunities to do that. But we, again, it's just our decision to kind of like isolate ourselves in a way. But I love the way that you described and now like you found something new for yourself that you didn't know that you like. Again, like we live our story. It's always us being attached to our own story. Yeah, definitely. Why yeah. we are the way we are. And we're trying to justify that, you know, like without really reasoning for it. It's for me, it's it sounds like an excuse mostly. But again, like we have to try new things. We have to see for ourselves and really like um, be open-minded and be curious and find a ways to, to have fun and to enjoy the process because that's what it is. Uh, we, we are here to feel happy and we need to find that way for ourselves. So that would be a great exercise for people to incorporate. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, for those who would like to connect with you online, how they can find you? Uh, there's, there's a lot of Alison Smiths. So you might be there for a while. So Landscaping Your Life will find me because Landscaping Your Life is uh, the byline of the book. So books can't see the wood for the trees. So if you look on Amazon or any other book publishing, but look for Landscaping Your Life, you'll find the book. Uh, the podcast is called Landscaping Your Life. Um, I always use the Landscaping Your Life hashtag, whether I'm in, um, oh, and uh, YouTube, the uh, channel is Landscaping Your Life. So Landscaping Your Life and, and or the hashtag Landscaping Your Life will find me in any of the social media channels that I'm operating um, rather than Alison Smith, where you'll end up with various different other people. Yes, great. And I'm also going to include that in episode description as Thank well. You. And uh, uh, what would you like to tell in closing for our listeners? What would be the most important thing they should focus on uh, today, let's say? Today, it would be the, the understanding that their inner wisdom is always wanting to talk to them and therefore to not discount the tangents they go off on. So notice when you say you want to do something, do something, there may very well be that little part of you that's going, what about this over here? And so actually pay attention to that. Just to be aware in terms of the difference between logical thinking, and I would say logical and conscious thinking, and that more inner wisdom that's very unconscious. Because, because certainly from my life, I've allowed my logical conscious thinking to make decisions and overridden my um, unconscious inner wisdom that is that part that metaphor talks to and the poems I write talk to and everything I talk to and all the tools are about helping people hear their inner wisdom. So for me, it would be, don't be too quick to discount that little whisper that you hear. So look out for that whisper today and just spend a bit of quiet time with whatever that whisper said, knowing that that may very well counter all of those must, sorts and shoulds. So if it's, well, I should be doing, I think I think the, um, what's the word? the the clue that you perhaps overriding that inner wisdom is when you go, but I must, I should, I ought. So if you're justifying actions based on should, must, ought, mm -hmm. rather than want, just sort of stop and go, okay, is that really what I want? Because that will get them back on, on a different track, I suppose. Yes, and that's important. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and wisdom. It was a pleasure talking with you, and I hope you enjoy your day. That's brilliant. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, hit the subscribe button and share it with others. Stay tuned.